Hey, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for joining us here at Cross Creek as we continue our series entitled This World. We're going to be in Genesis from chapter 39 to chapter 50 as we hit some highlights in the life of Joseph. So get your Bible ready and let's get started. <laughs> It's very easy to be pessimistic about the condition of our world, about the way our nation and how everything is going right now in the world. There's a story of a man who saw in a newspaper article a donkey for sale and he needed a good one. And he also saw that it was the local minister that was selling it. So he rode out to where the minister was and looked at the donkey and it was a good price. He decided to buy the donkey. Well, the pastor told him and said, you know, I've raised this donkey a little bit different. The command, the only thing the stubborn donkey will listen to move is hallelujah. And the only thing you could possibly get to stop this donkey once it gets going is to say the word amen. Well, the man thought those are a little odd, but it was a man of God. So he thought he'll buy the donkey. So the man buys the donkey and he gets up on the donkey and the pastor says, well, good luck. And he says, hallelujah. And the donkey takes off. And he starts winding through a hilly part of the countryside and all of a sudden a rattlesnake jumps out. And it scares the donkey and the donkey begins to run fast and faster and faster. The man realizes the trail he's on that this donkey's running so fast he's going to run over a cliff. The man begins to think, what was that word to stop this donkey? We runs over the cliff, we will both die. He begins to shout, stop, stop, halt. And then he remembered the pastor's words that it was a Bible or it was a religious word. So the man starts saying words like God, and he says the word Bible, and he says the word church, he even says Jesus. And the donkey keeps running faster and faster, and the cliff is about to get closer. So in an act of complete, utter desperation, the man does a prayer. He simply says, God, help this donkey to stop. And with that, he says, amen, to finish his prayer. At that moment, the donkey came right up to the edge of the cliff that meant certain death, and hearing the word amen completely stopped. The man looking over the edge realizes how close he came to dying, lowers his head and just simply says, hallelujah. I say that story to introduce the idea that it feels like we are about to go over a cliff. Over a cliff as a society, a culture, a nation, it feels like every day it's getting worse and worse. But there is some good news for you, and the good news is that Jesus is coming back to save us. You see, I don't know the date that Jesus is coming back. No one knows the date. In fact, Jesus himself said he didn't know the date in Matthew 24, 36. But we aren't supposed to win this war. We aren't supposed to win the cultural war or the morality debate. We aren't supposed to win it. In fact, we will lose it ultimately. And yes, we should continue to strive and try to make a difference in this world. But the simple fact is, this is not our fight. We are going to ultimately win because Jesus is coming back. And my Lord and Savior is undefeated in every battle he's ever had. So our one simple truth today is this. In this world, make holes of light into a canopy of darkness. There is a darkness that is covering this world, that is covering this culture. This is Satan's kingdom. This is his system. And it is the only thing that explains everything that we see going on, from the perversion to children being hurt to sexualizing young people. It is the only thing that can explain what we're seeing taking place in our culture and in our country. But right here in this canopy of darkness, make little holes of light. Reach the people that that are there right in front of you. Reach the people now. Oh, we probably cannot save the entire world or even our own state or city, but there's someone you can help. There's someone you can shine the light of Jesus on. Just because it is dark does not mean we do not share Jesus. And when it is darkest, the simplest light shines the brightest. This is the hour of darkness. Jesus himself will say in Luke 22, 53, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. That term hour could mean a reference of a 60 minute time period, 
but it really is a reference to an event. It's a reference to an age. This is the hour, this is the dispensation of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that this is Satan's kingdom. We are living in an hour of darkness. This is not our hour. This is not our fight. We will not be victory during this time period of this hour of darkness. But I have good news for you. This hour is going to come to an end. This hour of darkness will be overshadowed by the light of Jesus Christ. So what do we do now in this time of darkness to bring light into a dark, fallen, sinful world? So how do you bring light into a world full of darkness? Well, using the life of Joseph as a background, we're going to see three things today. Joseph lived in probably the time of greatest darkness. He lived in an evil kingdom. He lived in a materialistic kingdom that thought nothing of hurting children. He was stabbed in the back by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He will be lied about himself by Potiphar's wife. And he was left to rot in prison. And he was completely forgotten by the one who said he would remember him. But finally, he is where he belongs. We will see him as the second most powerful man in the world. But it is not as a politician that Joseph defeats the darkness. He defeats the darkness as a child of God. So the first thing Joseph did to bring light into a dark world, Joseph ran from the dark, darkness lifestyle. Genesis 39, 12 says this, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. This is Potiphar's wife to Joseph. And he left his garment in his hand, her hand and fled and got him out. Daily, the Bible says, she came to Joseph. She's probably a very beautiful woman. She probably whispers into his ear, no one has to know. Verse 9 of Genesis 39, Joseph tells her this, Thou art his wife. You are another man's wife. You're Potiphar's wife. How can I do this great wickedness, this great wickedness and sin against, not Potiphar, not even against himself, but against God. It's almost like Joseph knew 1 Corinthians 6, 18, when Paul said, flee fornication. You see, Potiphar knew who his wife was because the penalty for what Joseph is being accused of would be instant death. But instead of executing Joseph, he puts him in jail because he knows his wife is lying. You see, unethical people will drag you down to their level. Instead of dealing with his wife, Potiphar allows her to be part of his sin. You need to have a barrier. You need to have barriers between you and other people. The last few years, we were introduced to wearing masks, and whatever your opinion about that I mean, is, doesn't matter at this moment. But we were introduced to the concept of wearing masks to try to keep people's germs away from each other. You know, I would like to apply that spiritually. That's a good practice to make. Because everyone I've known who has played with alcohol and gotten caught and, and led into a life of addiction, everyone I've seen who has gotten dragged into drug use, they've gotten pulled into this world's lifestyle. It's usually the story starts with, I knew someone. I knew a friend. I had a cousin. Put up barriers between you and people. If Potiphar had done a better job on dealing with his wife, where would Joseph be? You know, the other lesson is this, you can do everything right and someone is still going to lie about you. In fact, let me just say this, if you do everything right, if you behave yourself ethically and moral, they will lie about you. Misery loves company, but so does sin. And Potiphar's wife, yes, she was embarrassed, but she was not going to lie in the pit of adultery alone. She was going to lie about Joseph and drag him down with her. Create a barrier between you and people who will bring you into a lifestyle of sin. Because a lifestyle is more than just what you do and don't do. It's the people you allow into your life and close to your heart that influence you. You know, the Bible doesn't really record how Joseph reacted to Potiphar. If he tried to make a defense of himself and tried to point things out. It just seems like he was found guilty and sentenced and put into jail and had given no opportunity to fight. What do we in this hour of darkness fight with? Well, we fight with a few things. We fight by resisting. 
James 4, Jesus' half-brother, verse 7 says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. One preacher has accurately pointed out, even a fourth-grade little girl who loves Jesus is stronger than Satan. Because when she turns to Jesus and resists Satan, the devil has to flee. Secondly, we fight with our testimony. This amazing passage in Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. You see, the testimony of these saints that they're being referenced here, their testimony was that they loved Jesus more than they loved their own life. Your testimony can say a lot of things about you. And maybe you tend to focus on what you were before you came to know Christ. And maybe sometimes in your testimony, you tend to focus on all the difficult things or the bad things that you did and got involved with. Your testimony is this, that you were a sinner separated from God, but Jesus loved you and died for you. He is your testimony, and he is more important than anything in your life. That is the testimony of someone who brings light into darkness. Next, we fight by quickly fleeing. The Apostle Paul gives the advice that Joseph followed, and he simply said in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, flee, just run, run from it. When you find yourself not knowing what to do, run away. You see, there is a pattern right here, and it is not a pattern of cowardice. It is a pattern of letting Jesus fight for us. You see, I resist. I resist by submitting to God, and I win. I overcome. I overcome by who? By the blood of Jesus and by the testimony of what Jesus did for me and who he is and how important he is to me. And I run. Well, who am I running to? I run to Jesus. The story goes of a little boy who came home from elementary school and he had a black eye and a bloody nose and a torn shirt. He'd obviously been in a fight. His father got him and took him to the bathroom and started cleaning him up and said, okay, well, what happened? He said, well, dad, I challenged my friend Larry to a fight. I told him he could pick any weapon he wanted to bring. The dad said, well, that, that sounds pretty fair and balanced. What did he bring? The little son said, well, dad, I wasn't prepared for what he brought. He brought his sister to fight. Look, it doesn't matter what Satan brings to fight. It doesn't matter how Satan attacks us and attacks this culture. We bring Jesus with us. And with Jesus, we win. We fight with Jesus. The second way we bring light into this dark world during this hour well, Joseph gave divine forgiveness. In Genesis 45, 4, he says, it says this, And Joseph said unto his brother, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. His brothers didn't recognize him at the time. They think he's dead or somewhere else as a slave. They came to Egypt during the time of a famine, and they needed food. And who do they end up talking to? May I say to you, I don't believe in coincidences and I don't believe in luck. I believe in Jesus. I've had the opportunity to look back on the last few years of my life and seen how God has opened and closed doors, how he brought things in and brought people, sometimes just for a season, but for a specific reason. You do not need luck and or coincidences or a lucky rabbit's foot. If you have Jesus, you have everything you need. It is not a coincidence that these brothers who left their, bro their other brother to die, to be sold into Egypt, are now face to face with that same brother. So Joseph has an opportunity here. He, all he has to do is say the world is, word as the second most powerful man in the world. He could say the word and he could have his brothers executed. Or he could turn around and have them thrown in a dungeon for a few years like he was. Or sold into slavery or to do menial tasks or simply to make them sweat it out. But he doesn't. He forgives them and he loves his brothers. You see, there's one thing the world cannot duplicate and it cannot duplicate forgiveness. Satan is a counterfeiter. He can counterfeit our music and he can do our music better than us. Uh, Satan can counterfeit preaching. In fact, some of the best preachers you might hear are people who are preaching a false gospel. And the church culture that we have, the community that we create inside a local New Testament church, Satan can counterfeit that with various organizations, but Satan can never counterfeit forgiveness. All forgiveness comes from Jesus. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, 
forgiving one another. How? Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Secondly, all forgiveness is after conviction. If you know the story of Joseph, Joseph at this point sort of appeared to be cruel to his brother. But he, in fact, he is making them think that they are going to die. He's not being cruel. In fact, he's showing them what their sin deserved. He is showing them what the real penalty of their sin merits. You see, this is Judah, one of Joseph's brothers speaking in Genesis 4, 44, 33. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of a lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. You see, he's talking to Joseph, not knowing it's Joseph, about their younger brother, Benjamin, saying, no, let him be taken care of. In fact, let me take his place. Why is this important? Well, this whole thing was Ju Judah's idea. In Genesis 37, 26, it says this, And Judah said unto the brethren, What profit is it to, if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? You see, forgiveness comes after conviction. And Judah is finally under conviction. He has seen what he did to his previous brother, Joseph, and he doesn't want it to happen to Benjamin again. When a pastor preaches, and if he doesn't preach for conviction, to encourage somebody, yes, to love Jesus and to know how important and valuable you are. But if we exclude conviction, you will never know the forgiveness that God has through Jesus Christ. Salvation is just that. You were convicted. You saw what you were. You saw, just like Judah, you saw that you deserve death, a second death, separation from God and Jesus for all eternity. And then you saw how God sent his son to die for you on a cruel Roman cross. And you humbly begged and repented that God would forgive you. You see, someone had to risk, they had to risk making you feel convicted. As believers in Jesus Christ, it is our job, it is our goal to point people to Jesus. It is our job to stand up for truth. And sometimes that truth can be very difficult and very unpopular. But it is still our job to lovingly care for people and point them to truth and let the power of the Holy Spirit convict them. Because the world needs Jesus, and it needs forgiveness. But forgiveness and Jesus come after conviction. And number three, how do we bring light into a dark hour? Well, Joseph realized he wasn't home. You see, at this time, Joseph was rich. He was powerful. He was taken care of. He was the second most powerful man in Egypt and probably the world. Slavery comes years later for his nation. He will never see it, but he knows this is not his home. And it would have been very easy for him to just enjoy where he's at and say, hey, everything's going good. I have all the material possessions I could ever need or want. This is where I'm going to stay. But Joseph knew that this place in Egypt, the world, was not his home. And one day he would want to be removed. He says this at the end of his life in Genesis 50, verse 25. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry my bones from thence. He makes everyone promise that, yes, when the time comes and you get to leave this place called Egypt, which is a symbol of the world, that you will take my bones with you back to the promised land. And what happens? Well, Exodus 13, 19 tells us this. And Moses took the bones of Joseph from him. And he laid straight sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones hence with you. Joseph left. He was not forgotten in the grave. He was not left there to spend eternity in the world in Egypt. His bones were removed and, as promised, taken to the promised land. You see, this is a picture. <laughs> this is a picture of the rapture. Paul says that some people will be in the grave when Jesus comes back and the graves will open up and their bodies will be pulled up. Some of us will be alive and we will meet them in the air and we will go and depart with Jesus and so shall we ever be, the apostle Paul says. He says, comfort one another with this simple truth that this is not the world, the end. This world that we see right now is very comfortable for us. We live in a time of prosperity. We live in one of the richest nations on earth. And even if you are poor in America, you are rich by the world's standards. 
It is very easy for us to turn and say, this is all we want. This is all we need. I had a missionary once said that to, the, to New Zealand and said the hardest thing for them to convince people is that there is something better in heaven because New Zealand is such a beautiful country with a beautiful climate. And so many people say, I already live in paradise. Why would I want to go somewhere else? Well, this world that we have right now, even in all of its greatness and grandeur and everything it has to offer, is nothing compared to Jesus. And I don't care if the streets are gold in heaven, if we get there and the gold is just simply pavement. I don't care if I live in the back room and a small part of a house. I don't care if I'm a janitor in heaven who walks behind a horse. If I'm with Jesus, that's all I need. This is a picture of heaven. And this is a picture of the rapture. Wherever Jesus is, that's where heaven is. And what Joseph is telling them, this world that I have, it has a lot, but this world is not my home. And I want to give you some encouragement, some hope. I want you to see the end and the final destruction of what the darkness has, what lays in wait for Satan and the darkness of this hour. Listen to these words from Revelation 21. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and we will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. If that was it, that would be enough, but there is more. And he sat upon them, upon the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto them, Write these words are true and faithful. And he said unto them, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and they shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, this is not our home. That is our eternal resting place, being with our God in heaven, being with Jesus at a place where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Praise God, no more death. We will never hear the word cancer again. We will simply be with Jesus. And those that have hurt children, those that have murdered people, those that have caused so much pain in this time, they have their final destination, and it is the lake of fire. This world is not our home. This world is nothing but darkness. But we, we are children of the light. We are called to poke holes in the canopy of darkness that is covering this world, one small hole at a time, sharing the love of Jesus and the good news of Jesus Christ. So I want to close with a little story. When I was a teenager, I was a, a bit of a troublemaker, I guess, to, to say the least. I did some things I probably shouldn't have. But our church would have hockey night and the, the teenagers and some of the adults and the youth pastor, we would play floor hockey. Normally I played goalie and that's really how I hurt my knees. And I was pretty good at it. But one time I had enough of being goalie and I went to play defense. And well, just to say the least, I, I bent the rules and stretched the rules and did things you weren't quite supposed to. Was often pulling people's sticks away and elbowing people a little harder more than I had to. Well, one time the youth pastor went into the corner to get a putt. I kind of followed in after him and I started, we were kind of fighting over the, the puck and I stopped playing the puck and I just sort of took my stick and started hitting the inside of his thigh with it. Well, he didn't really like it and I was probably about 16 at the time and he didn't like what was happening. He dropped his stick and as a grown man turned around and shoved me. Well, it was an interesting thing because, quite frankly, I deserved that shove. But a man who I deeply love and who's gone home to be with the Lord, Mr. Champagne, I called him Mr. C. He drove the bus, and I was the bus runner in high school. He came over there, and he got into that youth worker's face and began to yell at him and said, Don't you ever touch Steve like that again. 
don't you ever do anything like that. And I kind of stepped back. My brother-in-law, who I didn't even think liked me, stood up for me and did the exact same thing and said, this is not acceptable. Don't you ever touch him. How dare you? And they began to yell at him back and forth. And I stepped back and I thought, I don't really deserve to be defended at this moment. I really deserved everything I got. And quite frankly, he probably would have been right to take a swing at me. I think I would have taken him, but that's neither here nor there. And I looked with some sort of admiration at Mr. Champagne, Mr. C, my friend. And I thought, what a great friend he is. He didn't really see what happened. He only saw somebody coming after me and he was going to defend me. You know, that's just what Jesus is. I don't deserve it to be defended. I don't deserve for someone to step in and say, you're not going to touch him. You are not going to do that. I don't deserve any of it. But the grace of God through Jesus Christ, Jesus is my defender, my advocate. And yeah, when I screw up, when I make mistakes, my Lord, my Savior steps in and says, you're not going to touch Steve. You're not going to do anything to him. Yeah, he might be a troublemaker. Yeah, he might have messed up and screwed up, but he is still mine. May I say to you, in this hour of darkness, as the world is going to turn on Christians, and it already has in so many places, as people come against us for simply stating the word of God, for simply loving Jesus, as right is called wrong and dark is called light, and evil things are done under politically correct names, as they come at us, let me remind you that our Jesus will step in front and say, that is my child. You are not going to touch them. You are not going to take them. I am in Jesus' hand, and he is my Savior, and I am his child. He is my shepherd, and I am his sheep. And nothing I do can change that. No stupid decision. If you have made mistakes in your life, the good news is this. Jesus is trying to convict you right now to bring you back to him. You are a child of the God of the light. You are a child of Jesus. You are part of the kingdom of God and you have found yourself walking away. May I say to you, he has open arms looking for you, begging for you to come back and he will defend you and he will stand up for you because my Jesus is undefeated. No matter how dark it gets in the world today, it can't, it can't defeat Jesus. We are covered in a canopy of darkness. Let's go poke holes in it and shine the light of Christ to at least one person. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today.